Hey everyone, so today is Thursday of race week and that means tomorrow is the travel day and what we're gonna be spending our time on today is really just packing up, get everything loaded into the trailer. Uh, to be honest, this is kind of the grimy part of endurance racing that people don't typically talk about is just how many days uh, of preparation, uh, not only working on the car, but just making sure that you have everything that you need uh, to field a competitive 16 hours of racing. Uh, so it's just the grunt work of just loading everything up, uh, making sure you don't miss, um, you know, those 10 millimeter sockets that you desperately need uh, and can never find. Um, you know, the, we've, we've definitely had our fair share of uh, situations during the race where um, the driver radios in and it's like a scramble uh, to get to the pit wall to have all the tools ready for what we think uh, the problem might be. Uh, so best we can do is just be as prepared as possible, bring everything that you need. But you do have to kind of uh, pick and choose because uh, we're limited on space, uh, limited on weight. So right behind me here is most of the gear that we take with us. So let me give you a quick walkthrough. Blue pails, black pails, they're all spare parts. We have a, um, uh, a mobile lighting kit just in case, um, you know, middle of the night you need to do some major repairs, uh, get some light up just to be able to see everything. Uh, of course, the canopy for the pits. Um, it's super sunny so you definitely want to bring that spare table um, and this is our toolbox that we like to bring with us um, oh, it's actually locked up oh, top is a little bit jammed um, basically yeah just a standard set of tools that of everything that we might need of course probably a couple of 10 mils that are missing one of the cooler things that we picked up over the past couple of months is this massive tool cart that we got from a um, another team that we race against. And I think they, they may have upgraded to something a little bit newer, but um, let me show you kind of why this is so valuable to have with you. Okay, so the biggest advantage you're gonna notice is actually these giant wheels um, at the bottom, right? So compare that to the toolbox over here with these tiny plastic wheels that you know, you're, you're kind of running on uneven pavement all the time. Um, it makes a ton of noise and just kind of uh, shatters your bones as you're you're pushing it along. Uh, this is going to be great to be able to just stack, you know, as many tires uh, as we can. Um, in here, the fuel jugs will be able to go on here as well. It's a little bit trickier to see because it's against the wall, but it does have all these pull-out uh, trays as well that we can put in tools. And perhaps one at one point, we won't even need to bring the toolbox with us. Obviously, you want to bring your heavy-duty jack with you, jack stands, um, Honda Life. We've got two spare axles there just in case. Uh, pretty easy to pop them in and um, uh, very also a very easy way to end your weekend when you don't have a spare one ready. Over here, we also have a bunch of spare fluid. So our motor oil, we've got transmission fluid. We have only the fanciest brake fluid, endless RF650. This is what I run in the FRS, in the RSX, and GTI. Honestly, like you rarely have to bleed these unless you really abuse your brakes. It's the good stuff. As far as wheels and tires go, we've been running these PF01s for pretty much forever since we've had our, our old Civic uh, race car. Uh, we originally got the PF01 because of the concavity of the face. As you can see, there's a lot of space for the rotor uh, as well as the caliper. Um, but realistically, I think we would have been fine with something that has a flatter face like an RPF1, uh, which tend to be a little bit cheaper. There's tons of them, everybody runs RPF1s. Um, and personally, I think they would have looked better too. Uh, but the PF01s have treated us really well. And uh, you know, knock on wood, they'll continue to stay true and not get any bends from all of our endurance curb smacking. I know lately I've only been really posting about the GTI, which is my daily driver and competing in Time Attack, uh, as well as some endurance racing stuff with the RSX. But my first love, as far as cars go, uh, is the FRS that is right behind us here. And uh, you know, it's, it's funny because the car literally hasn't been started in I think over a year now. Um, last time I was tra at track with this, we cracked our custom manifold. Um, and honestly, I just decided that I wanted to do something special with the car and decided just to park it as I start to put together the plans for an eventual motor swap. I don't want to give away too many details now, but I will say that it will be turboed. And we are currently researching if we can put in 
uh, a bit of an exotic transmission situation. Um, no rush in getting this car build done, so I want to take my time and try to do something really special. Uh, hopefully be able to do time attack in this car. I'm thinking we're probably going to build something that is going to be in like the street mod, uh, CSCS super street kind of class. Uh, so stay tuned as we start collecting the parts and we're going to be partnering of course with uh, Driven Auto Sport in completing this build. Let's take a look at what is currently under the hood today. The infamous FA20. Um, a lot of good memories in this car and you know I've, I've gone through quite a few years and different renditions of the power plant and so what we have right now is it's a, it's a stock motor. We have the Jackson Racing C38 uh, Rotrex Supercharger Kit um, and all the morning mods around that, so oil cooler, um, you know, and uh, we've also got some Racer, Racer X catch cans um, and, and, you know, this motor bay is just probably like one of the most convoluted and, and messiest of, of most cars that you'll see. I will drop a hint that the new motor that is going to be uh, that is going to be added in here is really going to free up the space uh, make it a lot easier to work on so very excited about that one of my favorite pieces in this car so far is this anti-gravity battery um, it only weighs five pounds and compare that to the stock of 25 uh, pushing 30 it's a huge weight savings off of uh, a pretty high point uh, in the car and it's definitely gonna be staying uh, in, in the future build as well. One of my favorite pieces by far. As far as power goals go for the, the new build, um, hopefully we're gonna see if we can get over 400 wheel horsepower. Um, so you guys probably crunching the number, doing the math in your mind, thinking about like what motors could, could get us there. Um, but uh, yeah, super excited to get started and we'll be revealing soon as the parts come in, um, just kind of talking through every single piece that we've decided uh, and selected for this build. As we discussed in the last video, this car currently does not have any brakes uh, because the RSX had an unfortunate incident where the, um, the front axle basically, um, the spindle on the outboard cracked and the wheel came out and the control arm basically completely messed up the brake rotor as well as uh, a chunk of the caliper. Uh, but luckily, because like I said, we share calipers between uh, a lot of our cars because we wanted to be able to share pads, we just took the calipers off the RSX. I mean, we just took the calipers off of the FRS and put them on the RSX. So if you look closely, this car uh, is just rolling on, on rotors. But um, yeah, we obviously we haven't moved it since then. Um, but if you were to hit the gas pedal right now, it would just like gush, uh, brake fluid all over the place. As you can see, uh, just rotor, no caliper. There's a, a Gatorade bottle on the other side with the brake hose had uh, the brake line in there just to make sure it doesn't drip all over the place and ruin the paint. The very first competition I signed up for uh, in Time Tag was with this car and it was at Mosport DDT One Kink, uh, which is the faster variation and uh, I think OTA, uh, Ontario Time Attack, is the only organization that has been allowed to run that configuration because it, it is a little bit dicier. Uh, but the funny story is, or I should say more of the sad story, is the very first competition round uh, with this car, it snapped an axle uh, going up turn turn three entering into turn four. So not only did I have to retire the car without having set any competition laps, I also ruined that session for everybody else. Um, but you know, I tried to get away to the side uh, onto the grass off the line as best as I could. Um, but unfortunately, because they have to bring out the tow vehicle, um, that scrapped session for everybody else. So sorry, folks, but we will see this car out again maybe next year hopefully next year if things go well um but yeah we'll see speaking of snapped axles check out my spares bin of all these oem frs axles um yeah it's it's a pretty common thing to happen especially when the car is a little bit lowered and you're running a little bit more torque that the shock from shifting while the car is in a corner uh, especially on the driver's side, leaning into it uh, is enough uh, of a, a torque force 
um, sudden torque force to be able to snap the bearing cage on the inside of the rear axles, the drive axles on the FRS. Um, the reason why this happens is um, partly I think heat has to do with it because it's almost always on the driver's side and that's where the cap bag exhaust kind of routes around the diff and is close to the um, the inside of the axle. Um, so, you know, the, the viscosity of the, the lubricant, uh, it may be too thin, um, that's causing some of the issues. Uh, the other issue is just angle. So when you're, you're fully loaded on the left, the, especially when you're uh, lowered, the angle of the axle uh, as it connects, that cage is connecting to the differential. Um, the angle gets more and more severe the lower the car is uh, and the more it's leaning. So the contact patch that you have between the cage and the diff, that contact patch is getting smaller and smaller, which can cause these types of failures with the axles. Luckily, it's actually possible to pop the axles out track side, uh, even without losing your alignment. So as long as you carry, uh, you know, at least one of these guys with you, when you go to the track uh, with the FRS, you're gonna be fine. With the motor swap, because we're gonna definitely be pushing well over 300 foot-pounds of torque, we're gonna have to figure out some sort of custom solution to be able to handle that torque without snapping the axles. And one of the, the ways that we can do that, as I described, uh, part of the issue is from lowering the vehicle, we can offset the rear subframe um, with um, bushings that basically raise the subframe or you can raise the diff just to try to get that angle as close to OEM again as possible. So we have just finished loading up the trailer for tomorrow. Um, again, Friday's the travel day. We're gonna go to Calabogie. It takes about five and a half hours to get there. Hopefully a smooth ride. We're gonna see if we can try to sneak in for some practice sessions if there's a open lapping day uh, still going on. So we'll see what happens. But uh, yep, everything else that we just showed in this video has been loaded up into our nice Ludum trailer. Hopefully safe for the ride and we will see you tomorrow.